Welcome to Essence Trade Net, the series that highlights topical trade issues with our experts around the world. My name is Sean Stevenson, I'm a senior associate from Toronto, the Toronto office. And I'm here today with Paul Alone, a partner in international trade in the Toronto office and leader of the Canadian Trade Group. Hi, Paul. Hello. Paul, let's talk about the USMCA trade dispute. Uh, we're recently seeing disputes in various forms under investment, under labor, under state to state, under trade remedies. Uh, we're also seeing sort of a revival of Canada-U.S. disputes, um, particularly in uh, trade remedies for softwood lumber, investment disputes under the, le the legacy provisions of the USMCA, and state-to-state -state disputes uh, in relation to both dairy and, uh, and solar products. Um, can you just go over what the dispute, option, dispute settlement options are under the USMCA, and more specifically, where do the most recent dairy and solar disputes fit in? Sure. Well, like you said, there's been a bit of a revival uh, under the NAFTA, the predecessor to the, uh, the CUSMA, the USMCA, as it's called in the U.S., um, uh, state-to-state -state dispute resolution had uh, had gone very quiet. Uh, none of the parties seemed to feel that it was a, a very useful dispute resolution mechanism. But now, uh, both Canada and the U.S. have launched cases against uh, each other. Uh, as you noted, on dairy and on um, uh, solar panels. The, the, there's a bit of a buffet of trade remedies uh, or, or dispute resolution remedies that are available under the USMCA. Uh, first, we've got Chapter 10, which deals with uh, reviews of trade remedies decisions. Uh, so anti-dumping and countervailing duty cases uh, on that front, think of software lumber. Then you've got uh, uh, a couple of labor-related mechanisms. Uh, one in Chapter 31, which is a rapid response mechanism, and then uh, another one in the labor chapter itself. And then third, you've got still the possibility of limited invest investor claims uh, uh, under Chapter 14. And finally, the state-to-state -state general dispute resolution mechanism that's being used in the solar and dairy cases we talked about under chapter 31. So those are the options available for dispute resolution under the, under the agreement. But more specifically for the, the dairy and solar disputes under the, the general dispute process, um, what is the process for those disputes? Well, it's, it's a panel process, so a form of, uh, of ad hoc arbitration, if you will. Um, the process is, is, is kicked off by uh, essentially a complaint or a notice uh, filed by one of the parties that it intends to pursue dispute resolution. Initially, there's a mandatory consultation phase. The parties are required to try to talk to one another to see if they can resolve the issue. And then if that doesn't work after a given period of time, uh, the unhappy complaining party can move the dispute to a panel. Uh, where that happens, uh, there's a process for appointing independent panelists, uh, uh, which hopefully will work better than the one we had under NAFTA, which actually had some problems associated with it. But uh, in a nutshell, you have the appointment of uh, uh, panelists, either three or five, who uh, are then going to follow uh, a process provided for in the chapter and in, in rules that have been adopted by the parties and eventually render uh, a decision a little bit like an arbitration panel would, uh, would render a decision. So generally speaking, these are state-to-state -state disputes, but how do they impact business? Well, um, you know, for example, taking the dairy dispute, if you're in the Canadian dairy business, um, uh, the impact of the decision could be quite significant. Uh, in that case, the U.S. is complaining about the way in which the import quota for dairy products that's, that's permitted under the agreement, the way that import quota is allocated uh, within Canada. And the government of Canada uh, uh, allocates a certain portion of that import quota to what we call further processors of dairy. So if you're one of those further processors and uh, the decision goes in favor of the U.S., 
it may lead to changes in the way the import quota is allocated in Canada, uh, which could have a pretty profound impact on, on the way you carry on the business. So for people in the specific business, the, the impact could be a, you know, fairly significant depending on the outcome of the case and the manner in which uh, Canada decides to implement it. The last question here, if you're a business and you, you are impacted by, by one of these disputes or you see it coming, um, how do you get involved or is there a way you can get involved? Well, you can get involved. The, the Chapter 31 does provide for uh, interested parties uh, referred to in the agreement as non-government organizations uh, to participate in the cases with leave of the panel. So you have to ask permission from the, the panel that's been struck once it's established to uh, make submissions to the panel. So for example, if you were uh, a, an association of dairy importers in Canada, and you wanted to participate in the dairy case, uh, you, could, you could request permission to participate. And then if you're granted permission, uh, you could make submissions in the context of the, uh, of the panel dispute uh, in accordance with the instructions of the panel. So there is a way for uh, business to have its voice and uh, other stakeholders to have their voice uh, in these uh, in these. Panels. Thank you, Paul. Um, I guess for those interested in the dairy and solar disputes specifically, this is something to, to watch closely as those disputes move through the process. Uh, and I think generally the revival of uh, dispute settlement is a, is a good thing, specifically in the, the Canada-US context.